So we have the green light on the camera. So I'm Darren Tapp. I'm Director of Customer Service at Snoop Wall. I wear a few hats. I've got my work email and my personal email here. I'm also, uh, as a hobby, I also do a podcast every week. Uh, that You can find that at neocashradio.com. This date is wrong. This date on this slide is wrong. It's February 19th. That's because the last time I gave this talk was February 19th. Today is March 15th, just for posterity. Anyway, there were, for reasons to tell you. Okay, so first up, we have the thank yous. So I, I would like to thank some people. I'd like to thank Uli Walter, who's my advisor, or was my advisor when I was at Purdue. Joseph Littman, who gave me a course in elliptic curves, which I was extremely ecstatic about when I learned about the math behind Bitcoin, because that helps a lot to, for me to understand some of the math behind Bitcoin. And also, the, I, this, um, the whole reason this was put together was the uh, Boston chapter of the National Information Security Group. And also, I'd like to thank Kirk in Motion and Area 23 for hosting it today. We're doing it again. So I'm really happy we get to do it again. So, anyway, so thank you, everybody. All right. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about elliptic curves. Right? So uh, that's going to be the main thing. That's really the heart of the Bitcoin protocol. It, it, without that, nothing else works. Everything else is kind of, it's helpful, but uh, without elliptic curve, uh, specifically elliptic curve is digital signature algorithm, we couldn't use Bitcoin as we do. Also want to talk about some hash functions. Um, there's the names of them, uh, but I'm going to only skim the surface on those. I'm not going to go into the details about them. I'm just going to talk about how they're used by Bitcoin to help uh, protect people's uh, basically to protect their bitcoins, make sure they don't get stolen. Okay, and then uh, we'll talk about private and public keys and wallets. So this is going to talk about the kind of on an abstract level what's happening with the bitcoin protocol and I'm going to try to bring it down to some terms that you might have heard before like a bitcoin wallet and uh, so we can understand that in terms of the more abstract thinking. Okay. And then when, with the elliptic curves, there's an elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, and that relates to transactions. When we sign a statement, basically a, sign a transaction, uh, that's what we'll need to do for, uh, for, to send Bitcoins to somewhere, to some address. Okay, I also wanted to talk a little bit about known attacks on ECDSA, and I'll put the qualifier in here qualifier in here when I say known, that's known by me, or known by things I've read. And, and ECDSA is? Yeah, it's the elliptic curve digital signature address. So you put these two together, this one and this one together, that's what this is. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. So, uh, and then a proof of work in mining, so that's, uh, and a proof of work of mining, that's, well, not really everybody needs to know that, but it's kind of helpful to know it just because that gives me some some security with the whole system. And then I, I've got a little bit about what's after ECDSA, and honestly, I don't have a good answer. I don't have, a, I don't have something I'm satisfied with. I'm sure somebody somewhere uh, has a better answer than this, than what I'll have. But anyway, so, okay, there's one thing you take away today, and th that's uh, this statement. Electric curves are beautiful. That's 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 what right. one thing, okay? And there's an elliptic curve. Okay, so this is the picture I put on the Facebook group uh, or the Facebook events. Uh, but here's an elliptic curve. It's just actually the solutions to an equation. Okay, you could take almost any degree three polynomial two variables and take its solutions. That will be an elliptic curve. Almost any, not all the time. And uh, and so this is an elliptic curve. It's this equation is the equation that's used by the Bitcoin protocol. What's a degree three polynomial? Degree three polynomial, well, like this is a, like y squared, that two here is the degree of that term. Uh -huh. And then x cubed, so that's a degree three term. And the degree of that polynomial is the highest degree that shows up in oh, all so the So the highest exponent is the degree of that equation. Right. Okay. Right. So if I had a, a z to the fifth or something, I would call it degree five if there was nothing higher. Uh, or, or an x, if I had x to the fourth, y to the third, I, that would be degree seven. Four plus seven. three. What's the plus seven? Four plus three. What's that? The plus seven in the equation. Oh, plus seven, that's part of the actual curve that's used. Uh, 
It just adds some icing to the cake. Yeah, <laughs> it, like if, if I if I didn't have the plus seven there, if it's plus zero, um, just go through the origin. Yeah, yeah, this would be like a couple lines going through the origin. It would be kind of weird. Uh, it would be singular. It'd be a cusp. It would come in and then go back out, and it, it, that technically that wouldn't be elliptic curve. It almost does. If this was plus one, it would be an elliptic curve, but it might be a little bit too simple for some of the algorithms we want. We, we need some complexity so that we can't undo some things. So plus seven was what was chosen in the standard. Okay, so th there was a question, uh, if they did it differently, they could crack it easy. Well, I think the fact that seven's prime helps this be a strong algorithm. Um, but I'll get to some other numbers that come up with the protocol that uh, if they're not prime, that would be a that would be a security flaw. Okay, so uh, so one thing that we're doing with uh, let's see if we do the previous one. This is like some nice pictures, like the real num it's in the real numbers. Now, when we're dealing with computers, computers don't like to deal with real numbers, right? There's an infinite number of real numbers. There's no way it can really denote a specific real number like pi. Oh, yeah. like, there's no way it can denote it exactly, except as a symbol, and uh, so it doesn't know how, what pi is. Um, but So what we'll use for these cryptography techniques is a, a called a finite arithmetic, and um, so I, I'm just doing an example modulo 5. I picked 5 because it's not too big, okay? But What's a modulo? Uh, addition modulo 5. So when we do a addition modulo, a prime number, uh, what what it is is basically we identify it's like we go around in a clock once we get up to five we identify it with zero and then we go to six which we identify with one seven which we identify with two so if you had 173 modulo five you would identify that with three because 170 you would identify that with zero and there's only three more left so when we go mod a prime number we get a different type of arithmetic this is different than what you've learned in your preschool or first grade or whatever, like four plus one would be zero, or four plus three would be, well, four plus three is seven, right? That's what we learned, but mod five, that's two, okay? And, but this gives us a valid method of doing arithmetic, a, a consistent method of doing arithmetic. And here's the multiplication table mod five, okay? And since we went mod five, a, a prime number, uh, a result is that like three times two is six, which is one, uh, that, we, that we can always take a number that's not zero and multiply by something and get one. So three times two is one, four times four is 16, which is equivalent to one mod five. So the, four is kind of weird, one to four times itself is one, but neg and the real number is negative one times negative one is itself is one. Okay, so good. So now, now I did five in that. Okay, I picked five, and it was, you know, it was a pretty big thing already drawn there. But anyway, so let's talk about the specifications used by elliptic curve, uh, the specification of the elliptic curve that's used by Bitcoin, the exact one. There's only, there's one equation. Um, well, first, the, this is the name. This is what you look up if you wanted to uh, find out what I'm telling you. You just look up this SEPT, S-E-C-P, 256K1. And uh, that's, that's where you would find what the uh, specifications are. I just wrote it down here. It, it's defined by this equation, y squared equals x cubed plus seven. That's the same one prior. But if we're doing a finite arithmetic, we can still talk about being equal or not. So it's, it's this equation, but we're gonna be in a finite arithmetic. So on the previous slide, we used five, but for the protocol, that Bitcoin uses, we need to use this prime number, which I wrote out here. It's pretty, it's pretty long to write out, but the main thing to notice is it starts with a two to the 256, okay? That's a pretty big number, mm -hmm. right? That's over a Google, I think. It's over 10 to the 100th power, like 10 with 100 zeros that way, right? It's a pretty big number, and then you take away all this little, like two to the 32, two to the ninth, which is very small comparison. And this is what Gary was bringing up. So this, I'm saying this is prime, because I looked it up on a PDF and the PDF told me it was prime, okay? But if somehow it wasn't prime, which is, it's hard to check big numbers if they're prime or not. Not impossible, but it's hard. Um, but if it wasn't prime, then the, 
the uh, the algorithms used for the digital signature could be basically made like one problem could be made in two simpler ones and you can maybe can solve one each independently and then build the big one the a solution to the big problem based on the solution for the smaller problems so this had better be prime if you find that's not prime i want to know it okay. <laughs> and then that but this this prime is playing the role of five above right so <laughs> it's a very big clock right <laughs> oh, yeah. anyway so um and there, there is a specific known solution of this curve. I didn't want to write it down because how am I going to, going to code it? Uh, and then we'll discuss that specific solution later. But that's part of the uh, protocol, is that there's a solution that's picked ahead of time. And that's that. And th that's where you could put a backdoor in this. connect why a modulo is important compared to like a Caesar cipher and what a cipher does to help out people who don't know why this is important. OK. so. Let's see, well, let me just take a general cipher. Um, so the, the thing is we're dealing with computers, and computers really only want to deal with finite states. Okay, so if we're t dealing with like a continuum of information with the real numbers, a computer already has trouble with that. And we're trying to be very precise where we want this message to be signed, we can't be off by a little bit, right? If, if there's some margin of error, then maybe somebody could do it. So what we do is we build an arithmetic where we can do pretty much all the arithmetic with a finite set of states that a computer can be in, right? So that way, when we sign something, this is the signature, and that's it. You can't, you can't like approximate it or anything like that. So that's why we passed a, a finite arithmetic. When we passed the finite arithmetic, then you could now you're dealing with a finite set, then it makes sense to have a cipher. I, I don't know if that... Oh, I, I was that. asking kind of like, basic, very basic, what is a cipher? Like, what is it doing? It's taking A, turning it to yeah. Z? So a, a, a generic cipher, which we wouldn't use for cryptographic purposes, you would just, maybe just jumble the letters, right? And you you've might have played the uh, games on the, like they get those little books and you change the letter, you have to swap them out, and it makes a, a statement, tells you something. <laughs> Uh, those are pretty poor. That's just a basic cipher like that are pretty poor uh, uh, in just now in the age of computers. Uh, and then other types of ciphers have been made or, or encryption techniques have been made. Uh, you might be familiar with the Enigma machine that the Nazis had in World War II. So it would, it, like if you wanted to send S, 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 S just as a, as a message, every time you hit S, it was like a typewriter machine it would turn one of these three wheels. And if like once that did a full rotation, it would turn the next one. And so every time you pushed a button, the cipher would change. And if you understood the mechanics of it, you could, uh, you could undo all of this. But, um, but that, that was the biggest thing. Nobody could understand the mechanics of it until the allies actually did seize or get their hands on one of these machines. And then their Enigma encryption didn't wasn't as robust or didn't work as well. So that was kind of, but uh, so so that's a cipher that changes. Now what we're going to do? So this is cryptography. So we're kind of crypto. We're trying to t have information that we know, but we don't divulge. And but sometimes, and what we're going to end up doing is divulge that we know it in a very secure way, and that we can't really falsify that. Um, without telling people what we know that's what that's what this is all going to be based on so um, so that that's what we're building up to right so it's, it's not just a simple cipher it's going to be a, a bit more involved okay. Good. all right so any other questions okay all right so why elliptic curves i'm talking about elliptic curves why why elliptic curves okay um, because it, basically the answer, um, if, I, if I get away from what's on the screen, the answer is that elliptic curves allow us to develop uh, basically a type of algebra, a type of arithmetic that's complicated enough that it's hard to undo. Okay, that's what that's what elliptic curves allow us to do. So we have this funny curve or whatever, doing whatever. Now there's a way you can add. I'm putting quotes in it because it might not be the standard definition of add. 
two solutions of elliptic curves. You have a point on a curve and another point. You can add them together and get another, a, a third point on the, on the curve. And so that gives you uh, basically a complicated operation to do. Uh, it's not that complicated. I got some pictures to help with that. But that, here it is. That's a picture. Yeah. Okay. Great. So here's a picture that explains this addition operation. So if we have this point P and this point Q, well, there's only one line that goes through those two points. Okay? And then, because it's an elliptic curve degree three, it'll hit the elliptic curve at another point, at a third point, and then we just reflect it about the x-axis, and that's what we're gonna call P plus Q. Okay, so it's, it's pretty simple when we think about it geometrically, but uh, computationally it could be a little bit difficult, things like that to actually uh, carry out, but uh, you can. So basically, if, if they could take the uh, computer, say, could take the information and translate it into a pictograph of the um, formula that it's using, then it actually would be easier to crack because it would be easier to see. Well, yeah, but the computers, at the, at the as my understanding of the level they're at now, they don't, they can't really process pictures too well. <coughs> like they, like they're trying to make porn filters, and they had trouble with the porn filter thinking that a horse with a human body <laughs> and I mean, so they were blocking the horses as well as some other things but you know it's like there's a business that wants to have some you know protect the kids or whatever um, so I, I don't think computers are at the point where they can think geometrically yet but here's yeah, your they don't trend because this is this is a I mean this is what the numbers translate into and the computer understands the numbers, right? But it can't see this geometry. Yeah. No. yeah. Right. So we're still, we're still, um, yeah. So we're, we, we, we're, the, the human brain still can do some things that the computers can't. What about quantum computers? That these giant things that the governments. I don't know um, what level a quantum computer could do, uh, but I do believe that this specific digital signature algorithm would be under threat if a quantum computer came to be. I don't think it's... A quantum computer would break a certain type of encryption. It's called RSA encryption. And that's more than theoretical. That's, there's, you know, it's, it's well firmly established. With, with this, I think that a quantum computer would, um, would give it a run for its money. There are some things built into the protocol, we'll get to that in a little bit, that would help um, buy us some time if this digital signature algorithm ever got broken. So there are some extra steps in place to protect us. Um, so, but I, I, as far as I know, this, this hasn't been broken. There's a, over a, much like a six billion dollar bounty on breaking uh, this signature algorithm right now. So. Uh, so I, I don't think it's broken, right? So you can basically, well, it, all the Bitcoins are worth six billion, I'm saying that, and it's technically not true because as soon as it's broken, then the Bitcoins aren't gonna be worth anything. But you might be able to get some money out of it before mm. you let everybody know you broke the algorithm. Hey, Darren, a quick question on that. Doesn't having the digest help you uh, because you're passing around Bitcoin transactional information? So let's say the NSA cracked um, you know, their quantum computer that they have in Utah, they don't run out of uh, water supply. So, um, you know, they, they crack um, one Bitcoin or something, not the whole algorithm. Just this one algorithm. They steal one Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, maybe they can do that in a day. Not very exciting for them, and they're not, it's not a, allegedly a terrorist uh, that they're chasing. Mm -hmm. So, but let's say they cracked one, and some guy in the NSA stoned and took one with him to Russia, and then he just tried to take your Bitcoin that you were just about to use to buy something on Overstock. You go buy it on Overstock, he just has a duplicate of your Bitcoin. And that can't be used twice, right? Isn't it kind of like first Well, first yeah, term? it can't be used twice. So if somebody could hack into my Bitcoin uh, that I have, if somebody could, that first thing they would want to do is probably just trans uh, move it over to another address that they have control over mm -hmm. exclusively. And if they do that, and you still have the same keys or whatever, yeah. wouldn't it show duplicates of the digest as a Bitcoin that's a now a problem? No, Is that an area no. that I would just lose it. If somebody would. The, the, so what are the I'm ones on the, that site? Um, what's that main site you go to? Uh, 
the blockchain.info. Blockchain.info. Aren't there a list of like strange bitcoins or confused? Yeah, yeah. There's a we'll list get to of, that later. Well, um, the, so there's well the transactions that are coming up later. Um, if you remind me, we can get to that. So like that's when we my, do so my idea is if someone cracked this and you have one bitcoin, they have a copy of yours. You're saying they have to move it off of your pointer to your bitcoin so they can get the bitcoin. Right. They have, and if they do that transaction, you can't reverse them. Right. No. So it sounds like a lot of work to steal one bitcoin. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. And we'll talk about how there's extra stuff protecting Bitcoin, not just this one digital signature. Right, so if they cracked your Bitcoin, but they didn't move it, and you spent it, they're, they're then, then they, yeah. they'd have to crack it again. You, well, they'd have to, yeah, find where it went and crack that one, yeah. Right. So, so it's just moving it is a form of using it. Mm -hmm. so yeah. First time, first time. Yeah, you can have a an address that you <coughs> think is vulnerable, so you can move it to another address right away. Right. I mean, maybe you're think your computer got hacked, so you would just move, you just forget your old addresses and move it to a new address. Okay, and so here's another picture explaining the same type of concept, but this is when you add a point to itself, and in algebra, like if you take this point and this point, and you look at where, and you try to draw a line between them, uh, well, that's the same point, there's a whole bunch of lines there. Well, what the algebraists do is just take a tangent, Mm -hmm. to the curve, mm -hmm. and then that intersects somewhere and then you reflect, and that's what P plus P is. So in the picture, they call it 2P, but it's P plus P. You can add a point to itself, even though the last picture didn't make that clear. Hold on, hold on here. So you said this is P plus P, The Q. 2P is not the same as P plus P. What, the, what they're meaning here is P plus P. Oh, okay, so, so this is like legalese mathematics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have, I have on, on <laughs> both of the talk, I avoided this type of notation just to have less notation. But for this picture that I found that was really nice and explained it, they had this notation. So okay. Uh, oh, okay. I'm starting. To it's just P plus P. So like, if you take three plus three, that's two times three. So it's it's the similar thing. It's P plus. Oh. It's just kind of carrying I, it. Okay, over. I see what you're saying now. All right, and um, this. The equation up at the top there, y, y squared equals x cubed minus 3x plus 5, that's... That's the equation of this curve? That's the equation of that curve and that, there. That's not okay. the one that's... And that has with. nothing to do with the fact that you're doing 2p equals yeah. q. That's just a geometrical operation that you're doing on that right. curve. Right, so like, yeah, you have this one curve. Well, if we change the equation, mm -hmm. then you would have a different curve, and then your addition would be different, right? Because you... So the, the result of your addition would be different. So right. two, two, okay. two P is defined as the, the, the intersecting point of the line that's tangent at point one. Right. And then, and then you just reflect it. Yeah. Okay. Are you using this for mining? Are you mining your P's and Q's? No. It's oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, am I mining my P's and Q's? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I promised some, some of the other security functions, uh, or some of the other security features that are in the Bitcoin protocol, and uh, some of the, and so those are hash functions. So SHA-2 BT6 is a hash function which takes an input and uh, has a 256-bit output. Okay, so here's a little <laughs> diagram to help. You can put pretty much anything into this function and there'll be a unique output that comes out based on what the input was. So you could like take a hash of a file, often you'll take a hash of a password or a text thing or, or just any kind of data. You do this type of operation and, and the result's just a 256-bit number. Yes. Uh, they have this things called cryptographic primitives, which means different things in cryptography, different boxes, if you will, different subjects. You've entered another box. This has nothing to do with ECDSA in right. terms of. Right. It's not a cipher, right? It's. Uh, well, you, it's a hash. Well, so a hash is different. It doesn't have to do with. Yeah, the hash functions different. are not a cipher um, because there could be two different files or passwords that you put in, and you get the same output. Right. Uh, so there, it actually is impossible to undo a hash function generally. You don't know what yeah. went so into it knowing the output. So that's a hash function right there. Yeah, well, yeah, this is just a picture trying to... SHA-256 is what is 
as, as one of the standard hash functions. What is a hash function? Okay, so a hash function is a, is a function. It's a rule that you put things in and you put information in and information comes out. Why and you create hash? a unique number, like, like MD5 hash would be a good example for viruses. Well, why right. is it called hash? Is there I don't know. Because oh, it takes okay. stuff and it, and it mashes it up. It produces this long, mashy looking number. Or like a string of characters. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So when you take stuff, you chop it off, you mash it together, so it's a hash. So for this particular so for, so for this particular function, you'll put in some data, whether it's a file or maybe it's a, a, a string of text. And the result is basically, a, the output is basically a number. It's somewhere between 0 and 2 to the 256. And the purpose you want to do this is? The purpose what we want to do this is, um, let's see. Okay, because a good hash function will have some of these properties. Because a good hash function has some properties. Um, you would want it to have these properties, and so let's go over those. Um, it's if it's difficult and impossible to undo, or impossible. I can't say impossible because technically it's not, but it's difficult, right? Um, so now the question is, why would we want to do this? So the reason we want to do this, for example, one, the first use of hash functions is, we'll say you want to do. Somebody was putting in a password into your website, right? And you want to store that website, that password on your servers. Mm -hmm. But if you just store the password on your servers and somebody hacks into your server, the, the, the hacker will get the passwords. That's ridiculous, right? That's, that doesn't sound very secure. So what happened is that when you put your password into this, when you sign up for an account and put a password in, if they have good security, mm -hmm. the server will not store the password. It just stores the hash of the password. Okay, so the next time you log in, it just takes that password, hashes it, and compares the hashes. If the hashes are the same, you're in. If uh, they're not the same, you're not. Now, and because it has this property that's difficult to undo, if somebody hacks into your computer and gets all the hashes of those passwords, they're still going to have difficulty figuring out what the passwords were. There's many possible things that could create that hash, yeah. and you don't know which one it is. Right. And the bigger, or the, the more storage or the larger the hash or the more bits, the harder it is for multiple things to get hashed in the same thing. Right. Okay. Right. right. Take just simple letters, A, B, C. You hash that, you get C, A, B, A, A, B, C, B, C, A. Mm -hmm. and those are different. Yeah. So there's six different. of a simple three letter. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's, that's one property you would want a hash function to have, and because of this property, password security is an immediate application, okay? Um, a small change in the input produces a wild change in the output. Now this is like a generic, or, um, these are very general words, they're not well defined. As a mathematician, I'm cringing a little bit. But, you know, uh, you want like, if you just change the, the, what you put in just by a little bit, the output, and that that's, has to do with making sure there's like no real pattern that you can <laughs> determine. Was there a question? No. Okay, good. You didn't raise your hand, good. No. Okay, that's fine. That's stated. So, yeah, exactly. Well, no. Okay, the number of outputs must be large enough that a table of the outputs can't be constructed. So that's where the 2 to the 256 comes in. Mm. And uh, if you were a hacker, you might construct what they call rainbow tables where you take Gener general passwords you expect people to use and have the hash right there and look it up. But since the outputs are, there's so many possible outputs, you, you can't do this for every possible uh, password. Okay, so, yeah, so then there's two, there's two, two to the 256 outputs for SHA-256. Okay, that's a hash function. Now there's another hash function that Bitcoin uses, and it's this one, RIP EMD. 160. And it's the same concept. You put information in and the result is a, well, it's 160 bit number. It's just a little bit different. Okay, but that's what hash function, it's the same type of thing, it's hash function. Okay, so let's take some time to talk about pro public, private keys, and addresses. So I think we're going to talk about private keys first. 
Okay, so in the protocol, there was a specific point chosen of, of that curve, okay? And this, I mean, if, if there was some knowledge of that curve that, that is not generally known, that's another place you could maybe sneak in a back door to this type of thing. But anyway, so there's a specific point of that curve, you know, the, x, the y squared equals x cubed plus 7. Uh, that is chosen in the protocol. This point is chosen so that if you take it plus itself several times, you, it's, a, it's a while before you get back to the same point. It's quite a, it's a, quite a large amount, now, but it's around 2 to 56. A little bit less than the prime that was up there. Okay, and I believe the order of this point is, I believe that if you do add it up to itself and get E back, then that uh, is a prime plus 1. Okay. So, okay, so this is one of the, I, I think this is one of the easiest things to explain, but it's also probably going to be one of the hardest things to explain. So what, what a private key is, just an, it's just a number, okay? It's a number you would think of it between zero and somewhere around 256, but it's just basically, those are all the private keys you could possibly have, okay? Right? So it's a number. That's pretty simple. Okay, and then the public key is, well, the public key is going to end up being a point on the elliptic curve. So that, that's not so simple, but that's why we talked about elliptic curves at the beginning. So, so you take E, which is that particular point, it's publicly published, everybody knows what that point is, and you add it to itself that number of times, whatever that private key was. What is that point? Do you know? Um, I, there's no way I can express it easily. I can get you the specification after the talk if we have. Yeah, we have. Is it E a real number? E is just a point. So, point. so it's, it's, but it's uh, an X, like an X like like a very Well, you think about it as a point on that curve, so there needs to be an, a value of X and a value of Y so that when you plug it into that equation, you get a true statement. Um, and now that, now all the arithmetic that it's doing when you plug it in is modulo that big prime that I had up earlier. Oh. So, uh, that's, that's what he is. This is all two dimensional, Mac. Yes. What if you added a third dimension? Um, you could make different, uh, you probably could make different things. This is, this is I mean, you want to, you, you, there's no, always. That looked at curve had some beauty to it. Well, you could, you could. Could you do, you could do a much bigger round of Bitcoins or a I don't know. There, there's the algorithm? Just I mean, is, is, is there reasonable to say that there's a trade-off between the complexity that you're trying to create for hacking it and the complexity that is needed in order to use it? Yes, and wield yes, it? yes, yeah. yes. I mean, if, you, right. if it was yeah. too complicated, the thing is, this is like a one-dimensional thing, which is easy, the curve is actually one-dimensional, and I think, and if you were trying to generalize it, I believe, this, all the points and the addition between them, you could call that a Picard group. And then you could look at more complicated things, even in two dimensions, you could look at more complicated things and get a Picard group that's even bigger, like m many more dimensions. Um, and, I, I, and now you have a different arithmetic system, you could try to make something so, with that. So I guess the real question is, what was the catalyst to choosing this mathematical modeling building the Bitcoins? Probably because of the trade-off of okay. uh, making it computationally feasible okay. and, uh, and, uh, and secure. Yeah, also, it's been well vetted. ECDSA has been out since, I want to say 2000, the algorithm, maybe 1990s. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and then it's been NIST certified, although that specifically SECP 256K1 is not on the NIST list. It's on the SECP list, which is a different organization. Right. But it, the elliptical curve in general has been very verified over time, which has been incredibly important for cryptography, right? That's right, right. That's been I mean, held yeah. over time. You can't just come up with a new, oh, I'm going to do this algorithm. It's going to work great. Yeah. You know, yeah. It could break. You, you, well, you should to, probably put a bounty and try to get somebody yes. to break it first. And My brand new double ROT13 encryption. <laughs> Okay, people don't know what ROT13 is. ROT13 is a simple transposition cipher where you take every letter and move it 13 characters along the, the, oh, the right. alphabet. Oh, good. I know. That's uncrackable now. <laughs> 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 All right.
All right. The comet is its own crackable one now. Okay, so now we can get to um, now we can get to uh, the addresses. So the addresses, well, you know, I, I've got an address on the next one. Let me go ahead and do the next one. There, this is an address, right? So if, you, if you've ever used Bitcoin, you've seen things that look like this. That's an address. Uh, it always starts with one for Bitcoin. They always start with one, and then there's all this. It looks like gobbledygook afterwards. Looks kind of random. Hmm. Okay. The reason why it looks random is because what follows is, well, you take the public key of whatever address that you're interested in, take the SHA-256 hash of that, and then take the the RFP EMD-160 hash of that. So, and then you so the, all this L5R all the all that stuff. Is supposed to represent 160 bits. Why do you hash it twice? Um, well, I, and you get a little bit extra security, um, especially since they're different hash functions. If it was okay. the same one, that wouldn't really help too much. Before you uh, go forward, um, is that address? It's okay to know how many bitcoins yeah. are associated with that address. Yeah, you can send as many bitcoins as you want to this address. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Yeah, sure. I mean, I put this That's up. your address. But yes. yeah, I was like, if I'm going to put it there, I might as well put my address. Uh, <laughs> Unless I'm trying to donate to something. This isn't like LifeLock. That's not your social security. Right. right. And then the thing is, <laughs> right, and we just talked about a private key is a number. You can pick any number you want. And then if you, you, once you have the private key, you can get the public key. You get public key, hash, hash, you got the address. Right? So you can always get another address. You can just pick other private numbers. Hmm. But if an address is taken, it would be in the digest. Yeah, yeah. So well, well, I mean, I can't take your address. That's yours. You would have to guess the private key, ah, which there's yeah. two to the two fifty six guesses you can make, and you're gonna have a hard time doing that. Mm. So, so if I follow, uh, you make a, 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 a private key, which is a, a random number, could mm -hmm. be very big, could, could start with one going to like one to mm -hmm. ten to the one hundred or something, right? And then. Uh, then from the private key, you make a public key. Mm -hmm. And then from the public key, you make the hash. And then in those steps, you can't go backwards. Right. right. You can't go from hash to public key. You can't go from public key to private key. Right. right. Yeah. So um, I, I, you might have mentioned this, but I, I guess one of the properties of the elliptic curve is that there's only one solution to A plus B, you know, two points or the same point. Yeah, the X and the Y. Each, yeah, each, each, uh, each of those, either A plus B or A plus it's a two A, only has one solution, right? That is, there's only one point on the curve that that line. Yeah. Once uh, you have your P with. and Q, and or, you draw the line between it, there's only going to be one more point that it intersects. So that's, that's a kind of a, um, a property on this curve. And the right? only thing I shoved under the rug is that one of the two points could be a tangent. Right. Like if you have P and Q and you draw that line and Q is a tangent to that line, then P plus Q would be, well, Q. Yeah, it's like the, the, the reflection of Q, yeah. Oh, okay. And, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, there's a oh, there's, there's, there's 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 minus, minus, minus R could be, yeah, could be good, also Q. Yeah, there's this thing about tangents. That right. Everything, and, and algebraists do work with this just fine because they say that, oh, Q is a solution of that equation twice. Right. Right. <laughs> but anyway, the point works. is that there, there's only one solution to each problem like that, and uh, right. Well, I mean, once you know your private key, then there's only one public key that's associated with that private key. So now you take these hashes. Now there could be a few public keys, a few <laughs> um, that have the same address associated. So adding e to itself that number of times. Doesn't that take a long time? Not, not for a computer. Not for a computer. It would take me a long time to do a hand. So. Hey, Darren. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. You say it's a 58 base encoding. Yeah. That would okay. 26 letters cap. Yeah, 26 small. letters. Double it. You get 52. 52. Add the 10 for the digits. That's 62. Right. And you get now. You take away letters like O, capital O, and lowercase O. 
and okay. L. Yeah, I was just wondering which one is L because that can get confused at once. So I think they can move four letters to avoid confusion. I see. So so I was just curious to know which letters have been excluded from that. Uh, I know it's. I think it's pretty sure it's capital O, lowercase O, and a lowercase L, and then. I don't and know something else. Ones. Yeah. And Two more things. the one at the end, this is just a coincidence, yes. right? One at the beginning yeah. and yeah. one at the end. Yeah. The okay. One's always at the beginning for Bitcoin. Right. Uh, that's so maybe the one is excluded because it always comes at the beginning? Right? Yeah, yeah. This, this, yeah, this is really... Right. That's the hash. Okay. That's the hash. Yeah. Okay. Oh. And there is a one at the end of that hash. Hmm. So obviously but that's kind of random. Right. Yeah, yeah, but, but like... Not. If you were using Litecoin, there's an L that goes front, Doge, Dogecoin, it goes a D in front, right? And whatever. And what's the small M? Small M where? No, sometimes uh, there's some kind of uh, Coin that address has that has a small M in the test. Oh, yeah, there's test net. Yeah, there's a test, test net. So with Bitcoin, there's a test net, and the idea is that it's really easy to make Bitcoins on the test net. So they're very cheap, or they're actually free, like people will just give them to you. And, and so if you're doing programming, and you want to get your wallet set up on your website, you can do it for the test net first. Mm -hmm. And if it works well on the test net, then you can go live. And mm -hmm. um, Because, I mean, th that's the problem. It's pro it's, if you do the programming wrong, you could lose money. So uh, do it on test net, if you lose your test bitcoins, huh. you're, you're not going to cry. You're just going to, no. you might pound the desk because you didn't program right. But Do you know if Overstock uh, did the test that or did they might buy a wallet or license? Uh, they probably used software that was already developed. Okay. I imagine. I don't know. Oh, and I didn't math speak too. I, I don't know if you want to see this. Sure. sure. <laughs> okay, private key is a number. Yeah. Okay. And then say it's in this range. It's really from zero to that prime mm -hmm. or from zero to one less to that prime. Mm -hmm. That's around two to the 256. The public key is E added to itself n times. And then Carl noticed the notation could be N E N times E if I wanted to mm -hmm. uh, use that notation. I chose to leave it out. And then an address is the one and then this stuff. So that was your yeah. question about leaving out the one. There you go. So in base 58, and we talked about Y58. Um, yes, no good reason other than that's what we're used to as English speakers mm -hmm. and our keyboard like we have. Okay. Okay, so why would we want public and private keys? Okay, and the, we would just mention, given the public key is a difficult slash impossible to compute the private key, right? You'd have to more or less guess. Now, there could be side attacks and things, but uh, it's, it's, I don't know. I mean, I've got some Bitcoin somewhere. You can feel free to try to guess the private key if you want, okay? I mean, you can, you can look at any Bitcoins anywhere and try to guess the private key. Okay, so this problem, if you could somehow get the private key knowing the public key is called a discrete logarithm problem. Just want to mention that because I might mention it later. And it is possible to prove that you know the private key associated with the public key without divulging the private key. Okay? So that's that's where that's hold the that's how it's private, right? So there's no brute force attacks against the private key if you know the public key. Everybody knows you, you, you could try a brute force attack. I would expect it would be unsuccessful. How does the identifier and the actual password fit into all this on a Bitcoin wallet? Okay, so if you have a, a, a if you have a bit, so the question is about identifier and a password. So that's for if you have a wallet on blockchain.info. So blockchain.info provides the the service of generating some random numbers so that your private keys telling you the address associated with them and so then you can have Bitcoin sent to there and it also keeps track of how many Bitcoins are where and allows you to set, send them out with transactions that's the next few slides so that's what blockchain.info so the identifier I believe it's just a hexadecimal number it's just a number basically um, I believe they stopped when I when they first started offering the service. They w did allow you to use IDs, but I think people were guessing the IDs. Like I could use Darren for my ID, and somebody could probably easily guess that. Um, so they stopped t using, you know, login IDs because they're too easy to guess. So now they have this just this big number 
that you need to access their particular uh, software, online wallet or whatever. And then the password, that password is used for a different type of encryption. So if you use a blockchain.info wallet, the way it's supposed to work, the way to tell me it works is you, you get on there, you put in your identifier and the password, so and that identifier tells it which wallet you want. It downloads an encrypted file to your computer and then that password, which should not, not be broadcasting, or password just stays on your computer, the password is needed to decrypt the file that was downloaded. Once that file's un, 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 unencrypted, then you can see what your private keys, or you can see, then you can use your private keys to send bitcoins and all of that. But it's important that it's encrypted because if it wasn't, somebody else could, you know, see the private keys. So, and send so there are a lot of ways. Um, do you need online wallets? So no, you don't need an online wallet. You can, you could do it by hand if you wanted to. That's that's ridiculous. Um, but uh, uh, you could use uh, different uh, software to use wallets. So there's Bitcoin QT, which is standard client. Um, but that that will download about 12, 15 gigs onto your hard drive. Some people, and it slows your your if you, if you've got it running, it can slow your computer down. Now I mean. So that's where you're running the whole process. That, that's the basic off. client. So by using the wallet, you get to yeah, it's just, over that, yeah, then yeah, you want to you. Yeah, exactly. So there's the benefit. That's, but what about security? Mm -hmm. security. I mean, like, security. I can't so, mount Gox with it really a wallet. Yeah, that, yeah, don't count them as a wallet. So, so it, the they way... They're really secure because they don't actually have... Do so, they get your private key? I, I haven't reviewed the code, but uh, I do know people that work there, and I know smart people that... It, the way they tell me it works is that the, all the people at blockchain.info have access to is that encrypted file, and without that password, it's that's not going to be useful to anybody. Who is blockchain.info? What if they disappear tomorrow? Okay, who is blockchain.info? What if they disappear tomorrow? So if the blockchain.info is a company, I believe it's incorporated out of the Virgin Islands. Uh, the the uh, the CEO of the company came on, like Bloomberg recently. I think his name's Tam. Um, so I mean, it's not like mysterious type of company. Next question is, what if they went away tomorrow? If they went away tomorrow, when you set up your wallet, your online wallet, hopefully you put in a pat your email address. When you when you set up your wallet, you put an email address. And what blockchain.info does is, every time your wallet gets updated with a new private key or something that it has to re back up, you get an email. Okay, so then that, that with that file attached, the the, the so hit if encrypted. So you have the information. It doesn't matter if they're there. You can go right. Use access and then Bitcoin. and that file that's attached. So we talked about Bitcoin QT. Well, the file that's attached actually would work with the client Multibit. There's another client called Multibit, mm -hmm. um, which I think it's had a little problem with sending. I've heard people complain about sending. They'll send and it gets stuck, uh, and I think that's a problem with that wallet. But at the same time. You can access the private keys and you can get everything out through using multi. Okay. Yeah. The answer to her question, though, about what, how does the password fit in, is it's different for each wallet, right? How how that yeah, wallet you, you, uses you, passwords. You make it up at, at first when you sign up for a wallet, and so, it makes the file that it's the file is standalone. And in order to access the information, you need that password. But what a wallet is, what a wallet does is keeps track of your private keys for you, and that's the that's that's the important thing. Is the wallet keeps track of the private keys. How that wallet employs passwords is probably different for each wallet. But, right. I've never seen my private keys. Right. Okay. That's the wallet okay. does it for you. <laughs> right. Okay. If you, if you, to to uh, if you use blockchain.info to see your private keys, you have to go to advanced. You have to click on a, on a warning, and then you'll see some private keys. It'll be five. Blah blah blah. But the reason why it's advanced and a warning is if somebody was looking over your shoulder at that screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've been on that page, yeah. and I, I got on Okay, it. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's five, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so your, your Bitcoin's only as safe as however that wallet company is set up. So it's yeah. probably really important. Yeah, that and company they, is. yeah, and they use AES encryption, so that should be pretty secure for, for the actual file. So what company is what you're saying is a good wallet? Are there, are there a lot out there that are safe? Well, I use blockchain.info as like a checking account. 
like just you know little, little mad money. Do you put some that you can easily access? Yeah. Do you have some? And money? then I have some on an armory wallet, which. Uh, so if you took like all those private keys in the screen and blockchain.info, copied it to a text file, stored it on a USB stick that when you were running TrueCrypt mm -hmm. and you had a long password in your head, the quick brown fox jumps over whatever, mm -hmm. and only you know that password, if they go down or disappear, yep. um, you still own them? Yeah. And they can't get at them, they can't go buy things on Overstock. I'll yeah, I mean, as long as they don't you get those them. numbers. And, like, and every time you transmit how, how it, you've got to make sure. those numbers by hitting advance, but they can't. Because I have this password to their yeah, it, it so should we're not. trusting their uh, their security around our private keys. If you pull them down locally and then delete them, can you delete them from that wallet? You can. You can archive them. You can delete them. Yeah. But you, you don't. If you don't want to spend them, you just want to take them off the internet. But you don't need to use uh, any online wallet. Right. Your so, your wallet doesn't have to involve any companies. Yeah. It's just. Uh, something that's residing on your hardware and the, the, mm -hmm. the software that manages the private keys is, is all you need. So, so just for convenience. Yeah, so, and then I have an Armory wallet that uh, it's, it's just a file and, and that actually made my computer choke at one point. Like I haven't really used it the way it was intended for quite some time because it started to use up all the RAM on the computer. <laughs> but I can still type in my, and I'm, concerned about security at this point, so I haven't typed in that password for a while, but I'm considering to save it, so it's safe, right? It's there. I don't need to touch it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's also paper wallets, which, you know, yeah, so what, what a paper wallet does, you print out that private key, the five, blah, blah, blah. Generally, people don't want to type that in, mm -hmm. so they print out this QR code that you can scan it. But, mm. but I would only use a paper wallet for one time use. Once you scan, that QR code, there's all kinds of security things that come in. Like uh, the, most QR readers record everything that's scanned. That was out there. Yeah, so, so you just, I would use it for one use. It's probably very secure, you know, by the time you get them spent, but, uh, but I wouldn't want to keep using that same one over well, so and over. So maybe have multiple ones of different denominations. Mm -hmm. like this is one Bitcoin, this yeah. is one Bitcoin. It's, it's funny, yeah. So when I'm going to buy this for a coin, yeah. then I'll use this one and then throw it yeah. away. In the future, you're like, okay, I have the 20 Bitcoins, that'll buy my house, and then the <laughs> two Bitcoins, I might get a fancy car. And <laughs> do, you, do you only have one private key per Bitcoin? Um, you, per address. You can have as many addresses as you want. Um, and you can slice up Bitcoins up to a million. A hundred million. hundred million. So let's just take a normal number, uh, slice it up by 10, and if it's at $500 today, I'm only kidding. But let's just pretend. <laughs> that, uh, just because I can't do hard math. That's fine. So I have ten fifty dollars sections of one Bitcoin. How are they stored and how are they broken up and how does that fit with the private that, key? That goes into transactions. And we'll save that for later. Yeah, that goes into transactions. Okay, so, and this actually we kind of covered, so um, I'm going to go through it, but slow me down. I'm going to go through. Did I answer all the questions back here? Yeah. Okay, so I have different, well, I also have a, a thing on my phone for You said you have it on your computer, but it takes up a lot of space. Yeah, it wallet. takes up a lot of space well, and savings anyway, so I don't take I, I would liken it to like email, right? There's a protocol, an email protocol, it's standardized, you have to use it, that everybody who plugs into that email system has to use it. But then you've got Thunderbird email client, Outlook email client, Hotmail.com, or yeah, uh, like Gmail.com. You have all these providers. Gmail looks very different from Hotmail. Outlook looks very different from Thunderbird. The, the way you compose emails is different. The way you send them, the spell checker is different. They're all depending on the vendor that you've decided you like. And you're allowed to use multiple clients. You can use the Outlook client. You can use the Thunderbird. You can use them at the same time. You can have different email accounts. Bitcoin is very much like that. You're, but you're always, anytime you send a message, you are using a standard. The way it's sending is always the same, um, no matter how you're interfacing with that client. Bitcoin clients are like, like that. You can make them however you want to make them look. But when it, on the back end, Behind the scenes, it's always going to work the same. So your fingers on the keyboard typing in a long private key saying I want to transfer a Bitcoin or something would be the same. If you didn't have a wallet, there's a manual way to do it? <laughs> um, yeah, kind of. I would just import it in the blockchain on a phone and send it. That's what I've done before. 
you, so you couldn't go to Overstock and say, I want to buy this $500 item. Bitcoins are 500 bucks today. Here's my whole private key taken. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do that. Uh, that's insecure because you're transmitting the private key over a, a, a wire. Um, and so that's insecure, so mm -hmm. they wouldn't want you to do that. Um, because anybody, if anybody intercepted that private key, that would be an issue. Um, I believe that Mt. Gox, that recently went bankrupt, they would accept private keys, but as soon as they accept that private key, they would sweep that address and move it over to somewhere else. Because as soon as you send that private key, I'm going to assume that private key is compromised because somebody could have caught it in the middle. So you're saying only well, we said the 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 doubly hash address. Pointing to hidden private keys is the right approach. Well, yeah, just use the protocol as intended. So you want to send to this address, just say, I want to send to this address, type in the amount you want to send. And so Overstock has an yeah. address, like, and the whole digest yeah, is like, moving like I wanted to, moving public key information about a Bitcoin yeah, around. Yeah, I wanted to pay somebody exactly the amount. That, I mean, it's like a donation, so it doesn't matter what I pay. I just said, okay, I'll give them the exact amount at this address. And instead of giving them the private key, which is insecure, what I did was I just said, okay, put it in my buddy's address, and boom. And what did they put in your buddy's address? They I just typed in my buddy, well, I did not get it to transactions, it'll be more clear what's happening. Well, I, I just put in one of those addresses, my buddy's address. Hey, Darren, his question has to do with something you're getting to. Okay. Oh, and you've now lost me because you've gone beyond where we are. Okay. So okay. let's go back to this. So, Bitcoin wallet. We've already talked. It, it came up what a Bitcoin wallet is. Okay. Um, a Bitcoin wallet is a file that contains the private, private public keys and addresses. Technically, it only needs the private keys, but you can get. You don't have to do as much computation if you store the public keys and the addresses. And it usually will contain many keys. Okay. A good wallet will have many keys. You don't just have one address uh, if you're using the protocols intended. Now, if it's fine just to use one address. Um, but I will. it may also contain labeling information. So, like, a lot of wallets will allow you to say, you know, Mary on this transaction. So you, you know that transaction is what you use to pay Mary or Overstock or whatever. You can put you put a label on the transaction, and the wallet file will state store that label as well. Tips for Darren. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So digital signature. So this is getting to what Gary was asking about. So. Digital signatures, I'm going to go over kind of mathematically what they are, and then we'll get to how they're related to transactions. So uh, we can use our elliptic curve to construct a digital signature algorithm. I'm not going to write, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details, um, but um, one thing that's important for me to note is that a random number is needed to construct a signature. Okay? And it's again between like 0 and 2 to 0 56. It's just some random number you need to pick for. Uh, to construct a signature, okay? And, and in a Bitcoin transaction, to spend from an address, it requires a signature from the corresponding private key, right? So this signature is what divulges that you know the private key without telling anybody what the private key is. How does it do that? So the question is, how does it do that? Okay. Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about this random number that's associated with your with your your private key? You, you, you take the okay. So what it's doing is it's doing a computation with the private key and this random number, and it's made. I think it's like like. So it's rec someone will recognize that that this number that the result that is sent to them was created using this the correct private key somehow. Right. Even though they don't know what the private key is and you haven't told them. Right. So like you, you can verify the signature. So basically the way it works is you make your message. So in Bitcoin, your message would be something like, um, I, that I would like from this address to pay that address. Okay. That's that would simple. be your message. Okay. It can be a bit more complicated. But anyway, that's your message. And so once you have your message, then there's a basically a number you can compute using the private key and some random number that you divulge. You divulge what the random number you picked was. And uh, there's computations that can be done that verify, yes, that signature 
is, is works, right? You have your message and then the signature is like another piece of data. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, you can do a computation to verify that's the right signature. And if somebody changed the message, you would say, no, that's not the right signature. So that, that's a big deal about digital signatures in general. Because you don't want to say, I, I want to pay you one Bitcoin. And then somebody says, oh, no, he said, I want to pay him five Bitcoin, right? So you can't change the message, which is a big deal. Right. And uh, so that's what I'm going to say about that. I mean, it, it's a little bit involved. It's a lot. Do you have so a, so I, I, probably. I, I thought that's what you were explaining to me, is how, how a signature, how, how signatures work. Right? Well, I was, I'm just giving you a, a I skim off the surface with the signatures, and the one thing I wanted to say is that you need to pick a random number for a signature. An analogy I like to use that all people is you got a piece of paper, you're going to sign it. Like literally, you're like it's a piece of paper, you're signing it. Only you know how to make your signature with your hand movements, and, and let's say you're hiding your hand movements, and nobody sees. So you made your signature. Now, so everybody else can verify that's your signature because they look at it and they can see it. But ask somebody to copy your signature. Oh, that's very difficult. I don't know how to make your hand movements. That's your private key. That's your secret. But uh, if I look at it, I can see, oh, that's definitely you. You signed it. And then a transaction is that document that's been signed. So, how so there's a bunch of stuff. Do this, do this, do this, and I've signed it. Only I know how to sign it. I give it to somebody else. They see that I definitely signed it. They don't know how to make transactions themselves, pretending they're me, because only I know how to sign it. So how are they able to look at a signature and know that it's it's not. Well, just uh, compute. And they just can ha have programs that look at it and compute it. So, do, is it based on the address or the public key? Oh, okay. So, yes, it's based on the address. Now, when a when a uh, transaction is published, made public. So, you, when you have a signed message, that's what's that's what's going to end up being a transaction. So, when a transaction is uh, broadcast to the network. Uh, then also broadcast is the public key too. Not so, it, so it, the public key is just part of the whole yes. information that's the transaction. Then so once you have the public key, it's easy to verify that public key went with that address. You just do two, two hashes for that, and then uh, and then the digital signature algorithm. Once you know the public key, you can verify the signature. So I know how GPG works, where you put the public key in a public repository mm -hmm. where anybody can go to the public repository and say, this is Carl's key, right. and say, you know, I've got this message, I can see that, yes, this, this message indeed matches up with the, the public key, mm -hmm. and therefore, I know that this is a, a valid, uh, that, that this is a, a signed message. Are, in the case of Bitcoin, is the public key stored in the blockchain? Yes. Okay. Um, but only after a transaction from that address is is broadcast yes um, so you can have an address that's yours you can have bitcoin sent to it all day and the public key will never be broadcast never be published in the blockchain oh okay as, but as soon as you have a spend from it mm -hmm. and you do this transaction broadcast it out then the public key is broadcast no. and that public key will be recorded in the blockchain Ah, okay. So, so it's only after the first spin that the, um, the public key is available. Okay. okay. And that's part of the security features of it. I, I, mm. um, because if you have receive it at a certain address, it's really difficult to impossible to, under, to know what the public key is. So even, even if the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm was broken, mm -hmm. you still don't know the pro public key for these things. Now, if you have a spin from the address, um, then the public key is, uh, <laughs> is published, and so that address has a, um, a very small amount of less security. Mm -hmm. Is it published in the digest where you have a spin from an address as a percentage of a Bitcoin? The amount's still there, and the other, the other address has the amount it's taken. Like, if I have 10 Bitcoins, but I only want to trade half of a Bitcoin for something, I should have nine and a half Bitcoins left at my address, right? Okay, so this is a picture that's, um, it not, doesn't broadcast too well on the screen, sorry, but uh, yeah, but it's just from blockchain on info, you just click on any transaction. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, what this shows is that there's three inputs here for the transaction. So it, uh, you might need to, but maybe you have like half a Bitcoin here and 0.6 of a Bitcoin there, and you need to pay somebody a whole Bitcoin. Um, well, you're, you can draw from both of them on the same transaction, right? Because you, you can't, the half is not enough, the 0.6 is not enough, but together that's enough. So with this transaction, it's drawing on three previous outputs. Okay, that haven't been spent yet. And then once this is spent, then those, those outputs are spent. And, it, and the transaction just says, hey, put these Bitcoins here at these other addresses. And there's two addresses here, okay? Now, the, the fact that there's two outputs, this is very common. Almost every transaction will have two outputs. And you can have, you can have three or four or five, depending on um, some, specific, um, soft, some specific application may want to pay five people at once just easier to have five outputs. But usually when you're just sending one, a certain amount to somebody, what happens is that certain amount you're sending shows up at their address. And everything, like it, maybe this overshoots what you wanted to send. So anything that's overshot will go back to an address that's in your wallet. So you get your change. It's just like you get somebody a $5 bill, they give you $2 back. So you have five Bitcoins, you're paying somebody three, you, you get, you, you, the transaction says give three to Bob, but nobody knows that address is Bob, and then give two to this other address that happens to be your address. But the, the, the inputs have to be the output of a previous transaction, right? Yeah, the inputs are always outputs of previous so transactions. So you might, you might have uh, like five or six outputs of previous transactions in one Bitcoin address. The wallet yeah. has to has to pick those, those or right or one of one or more, or more of those yes, yes. one or more of those because um, so you can't um, the only time you can break chunks of Bitcoin as it were apart is during the transaction because right. then in the output you can you can then take this total of all the inputs yeah. and split it up any way you want right no. yeah yeah great um, so Bitcoin QT, uh, I, I, you said, and I, I was curious about this. Let's uh, just for the sake of argument, I don't know, ten bitcoins. You've got ten bitcoins, and you send out one, um, and then uh, what happens is it actually sends out uh, five. So the one goes to the person you wanted, and then four come back to a different address inside your Bitcoin wallet, right. and this happens automatically. And I was really curious about this because I knew what my public key was, and I'm, uh, it's, I'm not sure if it's blockchain info or a different site, um, you can look up public keys and how much money's on there. Mm -hmm. And my Bitcoin client, it would say, uh, you now have nine Bitcoins for this. Number right. one. And then I go look at my public uh, address and it would say you have like five. And the reason is, is because I had, like actually the, the wallet has several addresses, I own several, mm -hmm. and if I go look at it, uh, one of the other ones, Right. Uh, it's a, it's got the remaining four, yeah, and simple. that really confused me. Why is it mixing my bitcoins okay. all up? Okay, it has to do. Hi. So the question is, why is it mixing the bitcoins all up, and uh, specifically the Bitcoin QT client? So uh, let's say you had one address and you got two payments of five bitcoins a piece there, and you go what? And you go to pay one to somebody. Is that what your suggestion? Okay, so what? It's probably going to do is say, okay, I need to pay one. Okay, this one output, even if it's at that same address, which which is five bitcoins, there's ten total at that address. But that one output, that's enough. That's what I'll use to make the payment. And uh, so it it makes a transaction like this, where one goes to the who you intend to pay, and four go back to another address. Which is like now now that other address. The question is why. Now the other address is not displayed in the graphical interface of the client. It's in the wallet, it's saved, but it's not displayed in that graphical interface. So it's a little bit confusing because you're like, how do I know it's mine? But it is yours because I've used QT and it works. I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> the, the, the balance doesn't change to what it shouldn't be. So, um, isn't this inefficient and risky? If you want well, to sell okay, the so question is why. The, the reason why is because the, the, when Bitcoin was started and the first guy that wrote this program, he was interested in maintaining some level of anonymity okay so if you're always using the same address and same address same address if you ever get compromised at that address like it, that address gets associated with your name you know you put something online hey donate to me here 
then all your transactions, every to, from the end of time, if that's the only address you from the beginning of time, if that's the only address you ever used, are just publicly known. Okay. So the reason why this goes to another address is, is so that every time your address changes, you're, you're, you're maintaining some it's level mixing, of privacy. Yeah. yeah, but it's just it's not not technically not mixing. It's just that's if we're going to have a change address, it might be a well, well be a new one, well, so we can't yeah. track. You don't know who you're paying and which one was the change address. That's and you just made the point a little while ago that um, the public key is not published on um, if you're receiving, but it is published if you're sending. So when you yeah. sent that money, that one Bitcoin, you publish your public key. If you don't want that to stay published, you want you like it not being published, you have to re receive that money from somebody else that's moved out of there. and. And you have to get it yeah. somewhere else. They just do that automatically, so now you're still so you're back yeah. in the same so position you were before where no one knew your public key. And that's another that reason. So it, it helps preserve anonymity and it is more secure. So we'll follow up. So why, why did it, uh, for, for that, send out one out from 10, and then it sends out five and gives me back four to a different address? Why did it give me back four? Why didn't it just uh, send out all 10? Uh, give that one one to one guy and give me back nine? Why did it could. It Some wallets work that way. It depends. The, it's the just mycelium right works that way. Yeah. It only keeps one address, and by default, I mean you can add more addresses. But but some wallets have just one address, and their change mm. address is the same as their and, origin address. Yeah, and if you program it, you could program it however you want. If you wanted to always sweep the address so that there's no transactions left to that address when you're done, so you can just program it. Kind of arbitrarily decided by Satoshi. It's the way he liked. Yeah, it. and then of course there's people that made decisions since then <laughs> to keep it that way. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the Star Trek episode where they tried to board the board ship and they couldn't crack their shields because they kept changing the frequency? No. Yeah. Or, so, in other words, if you're constantly changing the frequency, um, then you can't hone yeah. in on something. Uh, then, yeah, That's the idea. It's a little bit better with the security. I mean, it, technically, it's very secure as long as ECDSA yeah, is, is not broken. And if it is broken, then this is a whole lot more secure. Right. So technically, it's negligible security. Now, in the future, it could be a significant amount of extra security. Okay. So. Okay. Address can draw from, and then this is the thing. So we talked about how address can draw from one or more unspent unspent inputs, and you can have multiple outputs. Right. You you want to do payroll? You can say this address, that address, this address, this address. Send one transaction. Everybody got paid. Uh, some people don't like this because of anonymity, right? If some, if your employee that you paid everybody at once looked back and said, "Oh, somebody got 700 bitcoins for pay. who's getting paid 700?" You know, they could try to do some forensic work and stuff. But don't they have a, a Bitcoin mixer product that you can put your Bitcoin through? And you you can. I yeah. There's uh, Bitcoin mixing services. Wouldn't that help with that? I mean, if you, if you yeah, if that's if you really it. wanted to be anonymous. I have not found a useful <laughs> for these mixing services, personally. Um, but yeah, if you really were trying to protect your anonymity, you could use them. They cost money, so I, I, I don't really, I'm not keeping too many secrets here. Okay, and then the input must be spent in full. So if it's too big, the change comes back. Hmm. So why is it the, the the input must be spent in full. Because it's just a it's a bit. It's either on or off. You don't have to say you don't when you're broadcasting the transaction you don't have to say how much the you don't have to say, okay, I'm spending this much to go here, this much to go. I mean you're kinda of doing that I guess, but it's, <laughs> But you're you're referencing a previous transaction. Yeah. So mean, every input is referencing a previous mm -hmm. output yeah. transaction. So I'm I'm just gonna answer computer limitations uh, okay. and, and also efficient code writing okay. so if you had to go through and calculate what the address what the balance of this address is every time mm -hmm. that might be processor intensive but the way it is now you just have to know is that there at that address or is it not it's, mm -hmm. it's one or the other it's, it's okay. a binary All right. so, so it, it's probably just because of programming so we saw this picture of the transit are there any other questions we saw this picture of the transaction, and then we this stuff came up in talking. A, a public key is not published until after a transaction is made. Transaction could include a fee by making the outputs less than the inputs. This is another 
great thing about programming, you don't have to have an extra field for what the fee is, right? You, you have outputs and you have inputs. If the outputs are less than what the inputs are, anything that's left over is a fee. That when it's mine, that fee will go to somebody. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of really brilliant. Anyway, uh, some transactions are non-standard and will not be relayed by the network. And um, if you, you could make a transaction, if you're just trying to make one, that would be non-standard, and most clients would look at that and say, I'm not going to relay it. For those hackers, and that's what uh, blockchain.info is showing that list every day that grows a little and changes of the weird, weird transactions, weird transactions, yeah. weird transactions yeah. ghosted transactions. Well, yeah, all there's, there's all kinds of, yeah. What is, what they, is that all hacking? Or what is all that? Um, well, there's like there's different things that it shows. It shows possible double spins or attempted double spins. Like if somebody tried to spin the same bitcoins twice, that could be done by mistake. It could be done by a hacker. The outputs could have a larger mm -hmm. amount. Than yeah, the inputs. yeah. That's and then that won't be relayed. That won't be relayed. Or <laughs> it won't be mine. It won't be it mine. It won't be relayed in mine. So because um, somebody would have to pay to mine that. Right. That so these are like blacklisted bitcoins after a while or something? No, no blacklisted. No, it's just the transaction just doesn't go through. So. Yeah. so these are transactions that don't go through. They never yeah. join the blockchain. Yeah, like, like there was this website that was trying to simulate gambling with bitcoin, or actually maybe they were successfully uh, <laughs> implementing gambling with bitcoin, and they just had these addresses sent up, you sent bitcoins to there, and if you win, they get your bitcoins back. If, if you lose, they send you a very small amount of bitcoins. Um, it was what's called a Satoshi, 100 million of a bitcoin. That's the smallest unit that the protocol allows. And, peop and if you get a lot of these 100 million things that aren't even worth anything, the, the fee to spend them is gonna be more than the actual thing. So what happened was they changed the the client so that it wouldn't relay these transactions with an output of less than I don't know five thousand satoshis or something like that. So, so that way, if some, if uh, the game worked the same way, this gambling game worked the same way, sending out the satoshis. As soon as that transaction hits the network, where it's got an output of one satoshi, whatever client sees that would just say, "Nope, I'm not relaying that." And that's that's one way that the network is trying to keep its own health and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, and then there's the fees. Uh, yeah, this prevents a, de a denial of service attack uh, because there is a possibility to stop certain types of transactions that helps prevent denial of service. Also, the fee is there not really for money making purposes, but to prevent a denial of service attack as well. Without. Uh, yeah. I like to liken transactions to like checks. You can have bad checks. Like I can yeah. sign a check that is truly from me, but it's right. for a million dollars. And I don't have a million dollars. Well, right. bang, the third party yeah. uh, says no, that's a no. Well, I, I, uh, I think of it as like you take a $20 bill from somebody, you could find out later that it's counterfeit. And mm -hmm. that's, I, I think the risk is about the same as when you're effect, accepting the Federal Reserve note bills mm -hmm. or or, check. Uh, or or Bitcoin. I mean, I really think it's about the same risk. But but the network is is is, uh, is the banker in this case. The miners are the banker. It's the third party that verifies and makes sure everything is true and right. fair and proper. Right. So yeah, I'm just gonna check the time. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> All right. So I have some um, a bit on mining prepared, but uh, oh yeah, well there's some diagrams. Picture of the guy who got um, in trouble with the TSA with this Bitcoin. Okay. That is just so, so Yeah, sorry. we can skip this. <laughs> okay, yeah, so for safety's sake, don't use the same address twice. That's whatever. Anyway. Wait, wait, so don't use the same address twice. That's because the public key is a, a broadcast as soon as you spend. So. And your the walls, good walls keep making them. Yeah, you, you keep making it. Like blockchain on phone doesn't do it unless you tell it to. Okay, so advanced. Advanced. I do custom transactions and I make a new one and make sure the change goes now. Anyway, so uh, what is Bitcoin mining? So that's something that was coming up in discussion. So Bitcoin mining is the process which allows disjoint actors, that's just people like somebody in Senegal and somebody in France and somebody in Boston uh, to agree on a particular transaction ledger. 
what transactions are the ones that we agree, these are the ones that actually happen, and that way we, we, ha we have a consensus. That's what, what is going on with Bitcoin mining. So transactions are bunched together in something called a block, and a miner approves a block, and a, this word I'm using, approves, that's a hard process. You can't just say, it's right, right? You can look and see everything is correct, like all the signatures are valid and all that, but this process was made hard on purpose because they don't want anybody just joining the network and making a whole bunch of blocks. By hard, you mean difficult? Yes. Ah, okay. Difficult. Computationally expensive. And this is where we get into the proof of work business. Yeah, that's the proof of work. So, and then once a uh, block is uh, approved, then it's, uh, it's broadcast to the whole network and then they'll verify all the other nodes will verify that's a valid block and even the approving of the, the hard process was correct as well. And right now, the Bitcoins out of a block is 25 more than what goes in. Okay, so, so that way, the people that are running the computers to do this approving are getting paid for, for doing that. Right now it's 25, when Bitcoin started it was 50. In three years it'll be 12 and a half instead of 25. So it's and that's inflation. That's monetary inflation of Bitcoin. The monetary inflation rate in nominal terms will get cut in half. So this is where every Bitcoin begins as part of a minor yeah. mining reward. Right, so yeah, I mean, how do you distribute the currency once you start it? Well, this is how it's distributed. That 25 didn't exist before, right? And then the thing is, like, I can make a currency tomorrow and say, oh, yeah, I have all these. I have all of them. Would you like to buy some? What are you going to say? I'm not going to be a part of that. Right, exactly. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. You're just giving me a bunch of money for maybe, you know. So this way, the, the, when they get created, they're distributed among people. So people are like, oh, well, they don't feel so bad. Is this the Moore's Law on, uh, you know, computing power increases every three years exponentially, so we're going to make it doubly hard to mine Bitcoins over three years or something? Well, it's, uh, the, the network has been growing much quicker than Moore's law, which is, I thought it was doubling eight, every 18 months. Um, so, uh, and part of that's because the price goes up. As the price goes up, there's more um, motivation to, buy to, more to get these. So, so you have more law, more Moore's law hardware. making the hardware more efficient, but at the same time, the price goes up, which makes people more likely to want to be involved. Now those guys who mine Bitcoins off of malware, where they created a systolic network, i.e. people downloaded a game and behind the scenes the game was doing math on their GPUs. So all, all they would need to do is approve a block and then broadcast to the network and then that 25 Bitcoins they can send to any address they want. They send it to their own. That's all they would need to do. So anybody with access to hundreds of thousands of computers could be mining a lot of Bitcoins right now. Um, well now that the network has upgraded to using application specific hardware, uh, I don't think you're going to make much profit doing, even if you were a bad actor using malware. To, I mean, at the time that they, they did this, yes, it worked. But if you try to do that again, I'd be surprised if you got any payout at all. Well, they changed Unless you the joined the resort, so they that? something that changed that is working more? Well, the thing is they're all competing and they're competing for the same thing. So as, as more computer power gets put into the network, the difficulty in getting the same thing goes up as well. So that way it's not coming out too quickly. Do you mean the next round of 25 or the next Yeah, the next round, yeah, every, every two weeks there's a number called difficulty that adjusts. And so as more people put their computing power into it, that difficulty goes up. And that's the way the protocol is set. So, and it's always trying to make it so these 25 come out every 10 minutes. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's probably hit around nine and a half minutes. It's not exact, but but that was the intention. And so as people get very, uh, very specialized hardware to do the computations, then somebody that takes over a computer and gets access to the CPU is not really going to be able to do that much, that many computations compared to the very specialized software. Yeah, specialized hardware, hardware, hardware is not much, software. much faster, like an order of magnitude faster yeah. than so. Uh, general purpose. It's not like they change anything, it's just getting more difficult so their methods. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 
you know, competed. The be yeah, the best you could hope for is that you get infect a few people with graphics cards, but the people who get infected probably are going to notice because they're going to get hot. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I, mean, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of... I don't think it's very effective now. When it happened, yeah, but now it's... You're saying these $2,000 proprietary ASICs or whatever, that say pop this card in your computer and run a Bitcoin miner, mm -hmm. 2000 bucks. it's still going to take you months to get you know, or more, and you can use up X dollars on electricity. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. So by the time you've mined your block 25, you spend 10 grand. Most grand. people, um, most miners join mining pools where they spread the risk, right? So, so what happens is instead of giving that 25 to just one person, that is everybody in the pool splits, splits it. When it when when the next when the next uh, block is mined, then everybody who's part of that pool gets a piece of the you know, divide up the. Are the, there uh, any pools that look profitable? I mean, cloudhashing.com keeps saying, "Join us, you well, get money." That sounds like a ripoff. Yes, it is. And then the thing is, it might sound decent today, but tomorrow, when the difficulty goes up, it. Because their hardware is static. You're buying yeah, the hardware they're hosting. It's the same. And it's the same hardware next year unless you, they, yeah. unless you give them more money to buy more the, the rate it's been going, you don't, you, I don't, it doesn't seem like you'd want to mine. If, I mean, if your sole purpose is to make money, yeah. you wouldn't want to be mining. So, yeah. You might want to mine. So one, one thing I noticed in Bitcoin conversations, I always talk about miners, but those are basically the bankers. And how many people in society are bankers? I mean, I... I I don't worry about money so much. Everybody. I mean, I, I mean, I've got a buddy Pedro. That's doing yeah, it. Pedro money. How many has he got? Well, he makes money at it. It's just that that for the most part, if you take that money and instead of buying an ASIC, you just buy Bitcoin, you'll make more money. Yeah, when it doubles again. Yeah, when the price doubles. Right. People that get into it unless you're going to make, so there's going to be equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Too many people do it, they're not making enough money, people let it get out. There you go. So there's eventually yeah. going to be a balance. Yeah, yeah. It's so. you're going to get paid for it. Right. Yeah. If, if when, when one of the uh, the first ASIC miners came out, uh, someone plugged it in and figured out with the, the cost of with the cost of the hardware and the cost of electricity, this mm -hmm. This device is making minimum wage. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. It's, it's yeah, you heard the electricity that it's. it's yeah, it's making minimum wage, but high. at least you didn't have to do any labor. Yeah, so, or no real labor. No real labor. But is it mining uh, solving a math problem? Where does the math problem come um, from? Yeah, I don't think I'm slide on it. Okay. Yeah, are you gonna so, say that? so yeah, so okay. The the question is about this hard. The miner proves a block. Okay, so this is the way a miner proves a block. They take the whole piece of information of the block. And they pick a number at random. That's, that's called the knots. And then they take the SHA-256 hash of that block and that random number. And the result is, a, is basically a number. It's a 256 bit number. And if that output is small enough, then, that, then, the, then that's what the proving is. But generally what happens is it's not small enough because you don't really have much control over what comes out of that hash function. So you got to keep choosing your knots. You got to keep choosing that random number. Choose, 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 choose. They do it billions of times a second for most miners. Sometimes I think you can even buy one that does a trillion of times a second. So the number that it has to be smaller than, where does that number come from? That comes from the difficulty. So as so the, the difficulty uh, goes up, that number it has to be smaller than goes down. Uh, and as the difficulty goes down, then that okay, number. Okay, I see. So, so in the pool of infinity, there are. 22 million unique yeah. bitcoins and yeah. or 22 nonces that would work or 22 million, million 22 million nonces so you got to find one and to find them is very getting harder every day because yeah. it adjusts itself around more people because the, the so the, the 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 only way to so there's no way to predict what effect your nonce is going to have on the outcome right because because sha256 is too complicated to actually be able to Say oh well, yeah. oh I just need to to add a, add two to my last knot yeah. and, and then I've got it. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically randomly trying nonces until you find one that right. that that and then the, the that ones that work under it's the smaller as difficulty goes up. So. I get it. Yeah. That, that's that's what, my Bitcoin mining. That's what this. 
minor <laughs> proves <laughs> a block so, means. So that's, that's what this whole line, a minor proves a block means. Is, is yep. And that's why it's hard, because you have to pick something that's... And there's no skill to it, it's really just random. Right? Yeah, you're, you're, you know, you're just, you're just, you're just, Scandling. you're trying numbers until you find one that yes. works. Yeah. And yeah. chances are none of them work. <laughs> well, none that you try. Yeah. None of the ones you try work. Yeah, because they'll do the, I mean, you can buy something on your desk billions of times a second it's checking and you, it might take you a year to, run, to right. actually find a block. Okay, so, Good, good. Oh, so what is Bitcoin mining? Here's where the pictures are coming in. They're coming up. Okay. They're diagrams. They're taking up pictures. They're diagrams. So each next block must have the hash of the previous block. And this is genius. So you have this previous block, and then the next one has to have the pre, like it has to have a, a, a reference to what came prior. So this sets up an actual chain where you can't just say, okay, I want to change this one block. You can't just like sub it out because it needs to fit in. And the, so, so at which point does a miner? I want to see a picture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, let me get to the picture. Okay. So it says it's so it's a chain. The longest chain is always considered the valid one. Um, and so, what if two blocks don't agree? So here's the picture or diagram. So like you have so two people could yeah. or two different computers could approve block eight at the same time or maybe they're milliseconds off and it wasn't broadcast you know the network latency they didn't know that the other guy did the block or something like that that can happen it does happen like if you go to blockchain info you can look at orphan blocks and you'll see them okay so what happens in that situation is that well either on top of this one or on top of that one somebody's going to eventually find another block okay and once that happens because of the the rule in the pr this slide, the longest chain is always considered the valid one. Um, well, this seven, eight, nine is now going to be considered the valid chain, and that one, um, if anybody's mining on top of that, there's a chance that their their le their efforts will be misappropriated. They won't get any reward for it. So All it will be for naught. Yeah. So what controls so if you're running mining software? What controls um, what what block? Um, you're you're trying to mine off of. You'll you'll mine. You're, you're, the software generally will always look for the, the longest biggest chain, chain and mine off that. And so when it sees a, so it, if you were mining on this one, and then all of a sudden you see this nine block, you're, the the a good software would switch just uh, immediately. Okay, okay. Yeah. So so if they if there were if there were say ten block eights, uh, it might just pick one, but well, as soon as it saw one that had something right. else built onto it, yeah. it would then start. I imagine it would go with the first one that it saw, <laughs> that, that it saw, that it downloaded. And then so, so it commonly happens that you have two, the, the, the blockchain forks temporarily. Yeah, the, this, is, this is supposed to uh, um, demonstrate an orphan, like you just have this one block kind of out there, but forking is when you have basically two chains uh -huh. like you have a chain that's yeah. going this way then it goes into two yeah so you could have like you know three blocks this way four blocks that way okay so what happens with all the bitcoins in in the the upper block eight there um well the, 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 tran the transactions uh it, it okay so the, a transaction in this situation could be one of two things it could be in block eight okay it could be in both block eights, right? In which case, if it's in this bottom block eight or in both block eights, it's, that transaction is confirmed. Oh, okay. And the whole network agrees that it's done. So you can, now, have, you can, have, a, you can have identical bitcoins in both yeah, Well, it's a transaction that's in both. So the, the collection of transactions in this block eight is gonna be probably different than- Yeah, it's probably gonna be different. The, the, the third thing that can happen is the transactions are proved in this block, but not in this block, okay? What happens when the, the restructuring takes place to now everybody's mining off of this block nine mm -hmm. is the transaction that was approved in this block but not this one gets returned to the pool and ah. rebroadcast through the network and so okay. and so it, that so it the transaction up. that was here could get approved in nine or it could get approved in ten oh. or eleven. Okay. All right. well, there's probably a lot of the same transactions in both, but right. there, but there could be differences. Okay. Right. So you said that there. Um, I'm, I'm 
I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll, so, get, I'll get a bit. So as I'm understanding this, you know, in a block, there's both bitcoins and there's transactions. Only transactions. Or there's, there's only transactions. There's only transactions. So but some of those bitcoins just happen to create new... It always draws bitcoins. from previously unspent outputs and then you you send them to the new thing. So. Okay, so I, I remember my question. Yeah. So you said that the, the block, they're trying to establish that the block takes X amount of time to establish the 20, 25. Um, I, so if your transaction is in that block that was not verified and it gets bumped, that's what would make your transaction take longer. To right, be done right, but yeah, like, okay. you, you, yeah, it's, 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 probable, it's probabilistic if a block gets approved or not. So when you're actually using Bitcoin, it takes half an hour to approve your transaction. It might be that no block was found by the network in half an hour. That's it happens. It's not so that might have happened, or mm -hmm. or uh, maybe it's a lower priority transaction. What would make a transaction lower priority is it's complicated. So that it's big in terms of kilobytes, has many inputs and outputs, or, or both, one one or both. Um, so that would make it lower priority. If the fee isn't sufficient, like if there's not enough fee, that's gonna help it be low priority. And if it's a recent output that it draws from, it would be lower priority. So uh, if you have a lower priority transaction, it might not get approved, approved until later on. Um, that's part of the denial of service, their denial of service attack prevention that Bitcoin just does. Um, are you talking about mining or um, I just bought something on Overstock and we update the digest? Yeah, so you, you, uh, you buy something on Overstock, you say you send in the Bitcoins. Overstock uses BitPay. Yes. So BitPay will say transaction complete. Even though it now, is an inst truly instant. Well, it knows that you sent it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I've, I've, I've used BitPay several times. It's, it seems to be instant. But what's going on behind the scenes is that uh, BitPay will be continuing to look at that address and making sure the transaction confirms. And it doesn't really matter. Like if you're on block, you know, a million and nine, it doesn't really matter if it confirms at a million nine, a million ten, a million eleven, as long as it confirms. Okay. Once it confirms, I believe the uh, BitPay will tell the the, the merchant Overstock, okay, ship. Does it right. confirm a math lookup that my Bitcoin that I just transferred is a valid Bitcoin so, located? So to confirm block. means it gets included into a block, and once it's included into a block, it's accepted as a valid transaction by the whole network. And that means whoever, when you say the whole network, whoever's hosting a copy of the digest, which is really like um, an accounting book yeah, where the, all the, the Bitcoins Yeah, the block is the next part of that digest. So okay. Once it's confirmed, it's in that next part of the digest. As you can see, you could have something confirmed that gets undone if another chain beats it. But if you have something confirmed in block eight, and now you're in block 13, the chances of getting a longer chain from eight to 13 is quite small. Now you just mentioned that technically they can wait to ship for it to be verified. What if you're doing an in-person transaction? Are they just taking a risk that it's gonna eventually be verified? In person, yes. Yes. Like I want to pay and then I want to walk away with it right now. Right. So they are actually yeah. so, a slight risk involved. Yeah. There's so people, sure. I, I assume people must have tried to do this, but you, like uh, double spend with uh, two transactions at the exact same time to Bitcoin, two BitPay, spots. and see what happens. Like try I'm to sure, spend, but try to spend the same. But if they're bit. shipping, I'm sure BitPay is going to say, "Hey, that it go, don't ship." Um, if it's like if you're you're talking about like you're at a restaurant, you're like at a Murphy's. restaurant, yeah. 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 I think yeah. the, the yeah. amount of work it would take to to undo it would be rather extreme. I was wondering if maybe Bit BitPay had their own like security measures that they use to try to see that the same transaction doesn't. I don't know. Get. Uh, I wonder if it could be like third-party wallet pay things that like guarantee. Cost that you bought it. Well, yeah, it, and people who pay into it have to pay a fee. Yeah, I mean, that this is still being developed, and I'm sure there's better things that can be developed. Uh, one thing that would, uh, a few changes that you could do that might help the protocol is, um, well, already they're, they're starting to implement like probability that it will be confirmed. Like, so, so like you, you get something that's got a sufficient fee and all that, almost 100% chance it's going to confirm. 
chances are they're not trying to do a double spin. That's a lot of work. Uh, if you're buying a cup of coffee or breakfast at Murphy's, that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot of work for not much gain. Um, so that's one thing you could do. Like, is this transaction likely to confirm? And then another thing you could do is that once the transaction gets broadcast and the, the person receiving has that transaction, they could rebroadcast it again. So that way the network gets saturated with that transaction. So oh, it would be hard to do. So when the guy went to buy that Tesla for 100 Bitcoins or whatever, they, they, they took his 100 Bitcoins, the digest got updated, he drove off with the keys and he had the car and everything's yeah. happy. And it, technically because of the time delay or the size of the file, it just takes about a half well, an hour. I've so been talking about, yeah, I've been, yeah. Yeah, I've been, yeah. I've been, I've been talking about getting crazy. breakfast at Murphy's diner. Do they take Bitcoin? They do, yes. Yeah, that's yes. why they're my... One of the waiters takes his tips in Bitcoin. Yeah. So cool. he's not reporting that tip to the government. I didn't know. Shane was well, fun for Murphy's. Okay. okay. Uh, we, he, 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 uh, he may be reporting that tip. Yeah. <laughs> 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 let's, let's, let's just say he may okay, be reporting. Okay, maybe he is. He may be reporting. Maybe he is. Reporting. Okay, reporting. Video. So, um, I'm put you yeah. anyway, so yeah, they, they, but like that's for a breakfast, right? If the person walks off, they're out of breakfast. Now, if somebody bought a Tesla for me, I don't want, so I won't wait for yeah. three yeah. or I'll four confirmations. Yeah. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. How do you see How that? Do you buy How do you cars? visualize that, those confirmations? Well, on blockchain. Well, blockchain.info, blockchain. yeah. you can see. Okay, yeah, so it tells you. How so here's the thing. Line. There's a lot of DNS servers in the world. And uh, I go grab an IP address or, or in, in a, well, no, I grab a, a web domain and all the DNS around the world has to be updated with my new domain. So, so until it's updated, some people can't find my website, right? Mm -hmm. It sounds like Bitcoins work the same way until that digest <laughs> propagates everywhere with a confirmation by multiple sources that it's all valid. But who are we trusting in that? Are we trusting the algorithm or are we trusting hosts of the algorithm with copies of the digest, what are we trusting? Trusting that a lot of hosts combined will not right. be. Right, it's decentralized. Right. So mm -hmm. we'll but all I hear all the time, which isn't a bad thing, is blockchain.info mm -hmm. and, and Neocash Radio. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> blockchain.info is just free. They're just, they're, they're, they're not the source of the information. They're just reporting on the information. Who else is reporting on it? Uh, was it MT Gox um, reporting on uh, it? The, the, it's not as pretty, but you can go to Block Explorer, you just Google that, Block Explorer. Could you can I find be it. reporting on it if I had that yeah, 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 wallet yeah. on my computer yeah, that yes. you're talking about? You can, yeah. And I could disagree with the digest? Uh, yeah, I guess. But you wouldn't get anybody to agree with your disagreement. Yeah. Then, then, when, then well, how do we know there's invalid transactions? Because it's, it's, more, it's, a, it's a consensus based thing where everybody has to agree that this is a, a valid transaction. Right. right. Understand well, I mean, like, how, yeah. many, how many, um, in, Rough numbers are there that need to agree right now. Do we know? It's all the nodes that are running. Do we know how many? Nodes um, the, are? the nodes don't always have a front end website that goes and you can and you can check. But there's, I would put a lower estimate, at least tens of thousands of nodes. Wow, that's great. I mean, I used to run so them no on my central bank. Bank. So explain yes. again what 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 is a confirmation. When confirmation is once it's included in a block, and then when a block built, that would be one confirmation. Then when a block's built on top of that same block where it was confirmed, that's the second confirmation. And so block, six is actually like an hour. Then. Yeah, six would you would expect about an hour to go by. Yeah. And for Tesla, I I'd make them wait. Now. Well, like, for large purchases, the bigger the purchase, the longer you're gonna want to wait. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, but like a you know twenty. Yeah, I, I bought a car with a right. personal yeah, check. I mean, I had a loan too, but I, I gave him a personal check, and of course they had a sign said no personal check. So I had to sign something that said if the check bounces, I'll give him the car back, and no deal. Right. Um, I mean, it's just so I'm small. still not getting where bitcoins come from in these blocks. So the the blocks in the blockchain just record okay. transactions. So, oh, oh, one uh, thing, there's a birthing transaction. So they there's no bit. Yes, there's no bitcoins in the block. But I yeah, remember so they, there's question. all these transactions. There's a transaction that births the bitcoin. And there's one transaction that has no inputs at all. Okay? Now that one transaction with no inputs at all, generally it's going to have an output which is 25 bitcoins plus all the fees for all the transactions in that block. The money being taken by the folks who created yeah, and then that, and then those twenty-five plus bitcoins 
end up at a certain address, and that certain address is D minor. The so part, part of part of putting the block together is uh, is adding up all the discrepancies between inputs and outputs. So those become the fees, right? Right. Which fee goes to the miner? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. yes. Fees, go to the miner. fees go to the miner and the mining reward, which is now, now 25. When the mining reward disappears because of all the bitcoins there are, is just the fee going to be the yeah. one? Yeah, mission? just the fee. That's and then uh, over 100 they years all from now. Disappear. Oh. Like all, the, all the rewards will go away in 2140, around then, maybe 2135 at this rate. Uh, but in 2040, effectively, all the fees, all the rewards are kind of gone. Like you're, you're already less than a Bitcoin or something. Um, What's the most you can take out of an ATM in Toronto now, or wherever? You know these Bitcoin ATMs? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's based on the laws. Like up to $500 bid or something. I don't, know. I don't know. It's Maximum. maybe 2000 I don't know. And when you take it out, they're instantly trusting the block update, right? They do wait at least a few seconds for updates. If I, well, this is a big question. Yeah, for confirmation. Yeah, well, the ATM, like our, our buddies Zach and Josh, they do one way where they take the cash and they're they give out the Bitcoin. Yeah, it's a vending machine, so there's less regulation. Um, that's the safe thing to do as long as you're not, that bill that went in is not counterfeit, you're good. Um, the, the unsafe thing is the other way where you take Bitcoin and you give out dollars. Mm -hmm. I believe what they do is you're at home. You, you send a Bitcoin into a, on a web interface and you get a code, like maybe a QR code or something. Then you go up to the machine, like later, oh. scan the code. And, so and then, you, then it can have some confirmation. Or that's, that's been a business model suggestion. So the big problem with the Bitcoin uh, is the updates of the digest of the in the agreement among up to 10,000 yeah, I mean, I mean, the, 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 the internet delays. So the level of security is different for different things. If, somebody, if you're selling a breakfast, your pr level of security probably can be less. But if you're distributing cash, that's going to be the one hack point. If somebody can hack it, that's where they're going to hack it. So with that, if you're distributing cash, you would probably have them log on at home, say, OK, I'll need some money today, do, 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 send up Bitcoins, and then they shut the machine, get the thing scanned. It's so a really like dumb password. question. You're at Murphy's, and he is paying, he's recording his tip. You're mm -hmm. at Murphy's, and you're buying a breakfast, and it's eleven ninety five, and you've got your Bitcoin, one of your many Bitcoin wallets on your phone. Is that how you do it? I just, I just scan a QR code, say send, and boom, it's done. You scan his QR code, mm -hmm. Murphy's Pub, and you type in the it's amount of a particular Bitcoin no, wallet. Usually, on your Murphy's, Murphy's it'll, uh, when I scan it, it pops up with so the right amount. And the right address, I just hit send. Uh, most I'm wallets, done. when you, you have like a send and a receive function, when you do the send, when you send and do the receive, you can specify an amount so that when the person scans your, your QR code, they're also getting the amount you're asking for. How come all different Bitcoin sites are saying the Bitcoin is worth a slightly different amount? If you go to Coinbase, yeah. it says it's 570.81. You go because to blockchain it, info or something. So that's a market. The different markets do different. So how, do, how does it's the like, guy it's get like different stock exchanges? exchanges. It's, it's the same way the stock it. market works. So he's getting a percentage. Of um, I'm I'm going to answer your question. We've been here about two hours now. If, if we count, if we assume we spent on time, so um, I'm I'm going to just make a nice break here. If somebody wants to, you know, get a drink of water or something. Uh, so anyway, so don't feel like you need to stay, but. Well, can you, it's awesome can you there. Over, overview what you were remaining to cover? Um, yeah, so I was just... Uh, questions at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, how does a miner approve block? So that was actually a question that was answered. You do the SHA-250. Yeah. Uh, yep. Okay, great. And then upgrading ECDSA. These are... I'm really not pleased with this, uh, these so solutions, but I... But been thinking about it, so there's uh, something called Landport signatures that you could use instead of ECDSA, and their their um, security relies on a hash function, which are quantum proof. So this could be quantum proof Bitcoin at some point, mm -hmm. like hands down quantum proof, no doubt. Yeah. Um, but the bandwidth is an issue. These these Landport signatures have a very high, like in kilobytes, public keys and private keys or public keys, and so. To broadcast them all around the whole world—that's just—that's ridiculous. That's a bad 
So it's 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 not a very elegant solution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what if there was a quantum attack or some type of attack on ECDSA that made it bad? Uh, I don't think. Um, if it was a quantum attack, I don't think larger fields would help. You could make different curves and you could replace the curve, but uh, that, that's something I would be concerned about if a quantum attack was a successful on ECDSA. And, um, and the current protocol is resistant to this attack because of the use of hash functions. That's what we talked about. So. All right, so that's what I have. Uh, there was a question from Gary. And